a check-in interview with the founders of New Foundation Farms about how they went from trying to raise 20 million to buy 1,000 acres in the UK to deciding to focus on building their stacked enterprise on lease land and ending up going almost full circle back to the beginning. Now having learned a lot in the past three years, they realized that in order to build a highly profitable and ecological sound business, they don't need 1,000 acres, but only 250. So they're back in fundraising mode to raise 5 million to show the world that we've passed the iPhone moment of regenerative agriculture. Which makes me wonder, what if they're right? What if we can build profitable, abundant, regenerative companies? If that's the case, that will put the food and ag world upside down. And those are enough reasons for us to follow the story very closely. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode of the podcast, a very special one, as we are back with Marcus and Mark of New Foundation Farms, and we have recorded uh, quite a few interviews with them before. It's a special series. I will definitely put the link below in the description or the show notes. And we also recorded uh, an update interview in November 2021, but we never released it because there were so many things happening in New Foundation Farms over that time that it just didn't feel didn't feel right because it wasn't up to date anymore. Things were changing and things have been pivoting, um, merging, changing, coming full circle. Um, let's say it's safe to say a lot has happened at New Foundation Farms. And I'm very much looking forward to release this interview, first of all, uh, but first of all, to actually record it and checking in with uh, with Mark and Marcus, uh, who I don't think we ever had together on the, on the podcast at the same time um, um, in an interview that we actually released. So it was great to see you at Groundswell and to uh, meet actually Marcus for the first time in person. And Mark, we've had um, met a few times and to check in. And now we're recording this at the end of summer 2023. And I'm so much looking forward to unpack what has happened, what is moving forward, your insights, and what's going to happen on the ground and so much more. So welcome. Welcome back, both of you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, Wonderful to be here. Thank you, Q. And... Let's say somebody's listening to this relatively soon, so somewhere in autumn of uh, 2023. Um, what would you say as a snapshot of where New Foundation Farms uh, is now? I remember, I think I put the headline a long time ago, you're raising 20 million and buying a hundred or a thousand acres and uh, like, like large numbers always do really well in titles. So we, of course, put it there as well, but it was your goal. Uh, where would you say you're now um, as we are recording this at the end of August 2023? We're going to have that funny moment where um, you know, whenever both of us are on any conversation, we look at each other to try and sense who's going to respond. So let me dive in and say where we are is we're about to launch a um, £5 million fundraise after an extraordinary 20 months or so since we last were live on the podcast and um with that we're going to acquire our first 250 acre site and lots to tell about that and build the first vertically integrated field to uh, home uh, hub in the uk for deep regeneration and the basis for the transformation of the food system nothing modest about that 
And what's the biggest surprise, I would say, and we, we get to lessons learned over the last 20 months, um, as you have been trying to fundraise, came to the conclusion that probably uh, in, the, in that market, and now the market has changed even more, 20 million and, and buying so much land it was a thousand. Now you're back to 250. And I know you were on a path for a while to lease land uh, of others. Like how has the journey been over the last 20 month, uh, months months? And, and what have you, what was the biggest surprise? Well, there's been a, a number of different um, pivot, pivots in the process. And the, the pivots have both been uh, brought about through our own developing thoughts. People who've joined the team, there are now um, 10 of us. At the same time, um, the conversations we've had with um, especially organizations that are interested in bringing finance to this um, emerging market, as you, as if you, if you want, um, have, have obviously hugely influenced us. And and one of the pivots was this change um, that we've pursued for um, yeah nearly two years um, of of leasing land instead of buying land. That that uh, was inspired by a large funder um, who who saw great potential in in the lease opportunity, and so we we worked that through in great detail, and we explored the that opportunity with major landowners in the in the UK. Um, in fact, we've 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 worked uh, through a holistic planning process with with six uh, landowners of of different size um, different sizes. But the um, the ultimate outcome of that journey was that actually the organizational constraints of um, large landowners, or in fact the the established world of institutions, um, has a real hard time as an institution, not as the change agents in the organization, but as the um, as the institution itself with its embedded policies and decision making frameworks and so forth. Um, that it uh, that that those organisations really struggle to engage with the necessary change. So that th that that we're facing individuals get it, they love it, they engage with it, they want to see it, and then when it comes to the uh, the the crunch point where you have to make a decision, um, uh, decision making committees uh, haven't have not been up to that task. That's been one of the major lessons and and the reason for several of our pivots since um, the first the thousand acre fund. Raise and then the pivot to le uh, least uh, least options, and now our um, uh, final approach uh, to buy 250 acres, um, which is so much smaller than the original um, thousand acres, and another big 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 pivot for us. Uh, Kun, let me jump in because uh, as I was thinking, is you know the great thing about being two of us on this is uh, one can talk and the other one can come up with an even cleverer answer but the the big surprise for me actually as I th as as, you, as Marcus was talking was that the big plan hasn't changed at all so here we are three four years after we started new foundation farms and our clarity of vision to be within a decade operating on 60,000 acres of land and having a supply chain ecology of 600,000 acres in the UK hasn't changed it's, it's all been tactical. It's all been, how do we get there? We have not had a scenario in which we've said, oh, hang on, we've got the wrong big idea here. This doesn't make sense. It's been all about tactical solutions to move forward. So for whoever didn't listen to our original series, what, what's the big idea? We're looking at each other and to see who's going to answer. Okay. That's so why we have the video. Big idea. We don't record the video, but we so, use video for this conversation so people can point. It's always yeah, useful. Yeah. Great. So the big idea is that, or well, the big insight is that the solution to the challenges of the food system that we've built are not going to be found in simply tweaking the system we've got. The big idea is that the power of the science of regeneration that has developed over the last 25 years through um, through our understanding of the relationship between things in ecology um, is opening the door to a completely new food system. That's the big idea. And that that food system is built on two principles. It's built on the principle that land can be highly productive and highly ecologically productive, highly productive for food and highly ecologically sound. And the consequence of that 
is that you end up with a requirement then to transform the whole food system between the field and uh, the person who eats the food at, at the other end of the supply chain, simply because what's happened is you're now producing lots of different things in smaller quantities in stacked enterprises on the land. And that enables you to, to then process and sell locally and do that everywhere. And that is the food system that is coming in our view. We want to help make it happen fast. And um, it will shatter the uh, framework of the current global commodity industrial system because you're dealing with the whole food pound in a way that can create a highly profitable system as opposed to the current one which doesn't make any sense for the ecology or for society or for um, those people who grow the food so why haven't we seen that stacking uh, yet if this is so um obvious through the regeneration uh, science that we've seen and, and also examples of very productive ecosystems, both on food and, and on biodiversity. Um, why haven't we seen many, let's say, larger scale, highly profitable um, iPhone moments, let's say, that everybody's like, yeah, of course. I, I looked at an ecosystem before, I looked at a farm before, and, and now I realize we were only scratching the surface in terms of potential. Um, what, what, what is unique here, or what makes this more than than a nice vision and why have we why haven't we seen this materialize in, in many places let me zoom out for a moment um in answering that question and focus on a different sector just to um establish a few principles when, when um the fossil fuel sector is um it pr delivers a hundred percent of electricity to to all homes um it seems to some people to be nonsensical to um, try out a different form of renewable energy production through solar panels or wind um, turbines. Um, why, why would you want to do that? It's risky. It's new. Nobody's done it before. We haven't connected it to finance. And then you have the emergence of a new kind of knowledge uh, and, and connection uh, with finance, um, and it creates disrupt disruption, market disruption through disruptor enterprises. That's what happened um, with the emergence of uh, renewable energy at, at scale. And um, we, we had that same um, disruption in the um, communication sector when landline telephony was actually quite fast, replaced um, by mobile telephony um, when, when people in the landline business didn't understand how that might be possible to the extent that some people now don't have a landline. It's no longer the necessarily default um, communications option 100, 100 years later. Uh, after the you know, invention of the telephone. But um, uh, then, then within the communication sector, there was this next thing that you've just referred to called the iPhone moment, where in a way, one business decided that the game wasn't about hardware. It was also about hardware, obviously, but it was about the software and the way that you use the piece, uh, the handheld device in order to enable a lot more than just the um, communication. And, and now we use the phone very little to talk to each other and for all sorts of other things, um, including measuring our, what, what we eat, how far we've walked, uh, I don't know what, uh, you know, listen to your podcast, for example. It's opened up whole new ways of thinking mm -hmm. about things that aren't possible when, you, um, when, when you're looking at it through the lens of an existing system. And so what is the we're lens there of the with with the food and egg sector were either at our iPhone moment or already had our iPhone moment? Just to say that metaphor, not that it's a perfect one, but just to understand, just to get to that for investors, especially why now instead of five years ago or in five years, like why is this 2023 the, the moment to, um, to, to put resources in this? We think we're at the iPhone moment because there is a technology that can transform everything. But just like you know, Apple launching the iPhone, what's happening to most people is they're sitting there and looking at it and saying, "Well, why it would doesn't you do want this? It doesn't do that. It doesn't. Yeah, it, doesn't yeah. Do all, and it took, know, all, it took all, quite a bit of time actually for many, including myself. Like, yeah, you need a keyboard. Yeah. Like, uh, well, of course, you're not gonna. And, and we all know how that ended. But uh, the yeah. BlackBerry. So, and yeah, that's an interesting point. And, and so, um, if you draw the parallel, what's happening in the in the food sector is 
um, the the scaled response currently is not an iPhone response. It's a landline response where what's happening is big food, big players in the food industry are simply saying, okay, there's this new technology. What it means is we can make more ecologically friendly food and shove it through the same supply chain. And so where's all the, the emphasis? It's on quality assurance down the supply chain and things called standards so that we can measure whether or not something is ecologically sound. But it's not doing what 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 um, Apple saw in the iPhone. They said, hang on, this is going to change everything. Um, why? Because it enables us to do things we couldn't do before. You couldn't deliver low-cost, affordable, nutrient-dense food to everybody without a socking great global supply chain. We believe we now can. That is the power of what the regenerative system enables. And that is requires a level of um, reorganization of the food system that is uh, way beyond simply um, you know, making sure that uh, what you buy at um, Aldi or Lidl or Sainsbury's or whichever is your favorite supermarket is more eco-friendly. It's, it's a completely different supply chain. Just imagine, last point, and then I'll s- – is just imagine you – know, somebody said to me the other day, it is – with all the technological development we've got, we're still doing what we did in the 1930s. We're going to the supermarket to buy our food, um, notwithstanding the home delivery, most of which is actually people in a truck walking into a supermarket and picking it off the shelves and delivering it for us. You know, that, that's an that's a incredibly undeveloped uh, an unreformed uh, food system compared with what's now possible, where we can have 90% of the nutrients that we all eat delivered directly to our homes, fresh from predominantly local grown sources, enabled by this regenerative system. Now, that's the iPhone moment because people, we, what we think is that very few people are, are seeing that opportunity and putting in place the capacities and the resources to do it. So what they're doing is typically saying, okay, well, um, we need to do things more regeneratively, but hang on, it's complicated because we've got to have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 different enterprise stacks on the farm, and I'm just one man and a farmer, and I can't do that, and it's usually one old man as well. And we say, no, 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 that, that, you know, in any other industry, you would say, hang on, that means we need to reorganize everything. We need a much more sophisticated organization that are capable of this vertical integration. So there's a whole lot behind this that is critical to the transformation and is also um, the potential of the opportunity that can be now captured right now. We don't need to wait. It can be done today. And yet you didn't manage to, to convince a large landowner to, to, to get on board with that, or at least the, not the final decision makers or the committee, maybe there were enough people or were a few people that were interested in this. Um, but that process did get you to realize that you don't need uh, a thousand acres to to start, which I think is a very valuable uh, lesson. So how how did that process go, and how did you realize you need one fourth, basically, which also brings down. Not saying it's easier to raise five million compared to twenty, uh, but it's actually it's it's a lot less money, so it might 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 be easier. So how did that process um, go from from one thousand to two hundred and fifty, realizing that that could be let's say the MVP, or that could be uh, enough to to show a lot of these things because all of this is on paper all of this has been calculated all of this makes a lot of sense but un- until people sh- see it feel it touch it and see um what a, a really productive stacked enterprise uh, farm could be i think it's going to be very difficult for people for many people to to see see the potential until you saw the iphone it was very difficult to see the potential of of touch screens etc even though we saw a few small examples here and there which we also see in food and ag, we see a few farms really stacking a few things and doing relatively well, um, but you don't see it at scale, or at least not not a lot. So how, how did the process go from 1,000 to 50? And, and was that a moment? Was that a calculation? Was that a realization? Like, oh, actually, we, we need less. Let me, let me zoom out one more time. Um, when we started, we were, absolute, we, we were absolutely persuaded that regenerative approaches to agriculture were the method, if you want, that was going to make it possible for us to transform the way we produce food for um, our form of civilization, um, that that would take it from an approach that was 
um, depletive or degenerative of the um, underpinning ecological asset to building it. But that um, the way farming is organized, especially in, in the UK, you've actually got a situation where um, you have um, it's a, currently just as a statistic, 3% of the farmland in the UK or less is organically certified. Um, uh, there are 20 million acres of, of farmland or land under man agricultural management in the UK. There are 220,000 farms approximately. So there's an average of about 200 acres. There are a lot of people doing lots of very inspired and good work in small ways. What we recognized is a lot of small doesn't make big. What we also recognized is this, um, this disconnect between large um, investors and small good projects. And it's not, it's, there's a clash of values, a clash of um, perspectives, Language. but also a very, mm -hmm. yeah, like how do you translate uh, um, an organic market garden into an investable asset class? It's difficult. Um, there isn't the spreadsheet that you can download um there isn't the um the, the the master class that you can do and then do you have the time um do you um do you have the time as somebody engaged in this it's a real struggle getting access to land so there are hurdles stacked um against new entrants with new ideas the the the, the market the free market isn't quite so free when it comes to farming there are some very vested interests in maintaining a fragmented uh, disparate uh, workforce, um, in, uh, in mostly men, um, if it's arable or whatever else, in, in a tractor cabin, and, and organizing it in such a way that they eke out, um, um, barely eke out a, a livelihood and supply food that they don't even know what it tastes like and so forth. And it, it's, it's a, in, in systems thinking, you would call that a pathway. It's entrenched. This is people get out of bed. They think like this. They don't have enough time to think any other way or to educate themselves to do it differently. So you've got this disconnect between small and big, both in terms of the finances and in terms of um, how people go about the practice. And, and so it's very difficult to find a lever point in that to change it. So, the lever point that we've been focusing on with New Foundation Farms is how do you take something like this and develop an enterprise that's scalable both in operations and impact? Um, and that's that's a paradox in there, which is that most scaled large enterprises are actually centralized. Whereas in um, if, if you think through holistic approaches and, and regenerative approaches to land, one of the uh, mantras or the first principles you'll come across is that it's all context specific. So ultimately, you have to find a way of managing something, of organizing something in such a way that it's place-based. If something is place-based in, in, in the world we're living in at the moment, this is a total paradigm shift. Forget about all the other details. Business is not organized in a place-based way. We're organized in a globalized, uniform, standardized way where we do things in one country and, and, and the same way in another country because that's allowed us to create thousands of widgets in the same way and then, and then um, sell them in various ways um, across the planet. What we're proposing is that it's possible to create a large enterprise that's actually sensitive to local context, grow a, an abundant, hyper-diverse range of uh, fru food, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, um, meats, etc., and distribute that as locally as possible to as many people as possible. We call that hyper-diverse, hyper-local everywhere. So um, that's there's a lot of complexity there, which is why I talk about the, the this the the, the 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 iPhone moment was the switch from hardware to software, and I'm sure that there were plenty of people who said people don't want a, a mobile computer, they don't want to tick all those boxes, they just want to talk to someone, and those people, the so-called late adopters or laggards in the adoption curve, they're a waste of time to talk to because they're very good at maintaining the status quo, but they're not very good at disrupting the status quo. We're, we're about disrupting the status quo. And, and um, th th this is ultimately when you think those thoughts through, you, you, you end up with this kind of place-based um, logic. Um, and there's one final thing in this, which is that as we went deeper and deeper into the, to the logic, 
we arrived at the recognition that this isn't just about a different way of doing business. This is about a different way of perceiving of ourselves as human beings on planet Earth. The, this, this, this way of thinking doesn't, um, isn't possible unless you recognize the possibility of yourself as being a custodial species on, on planet Earth, which is anathema to the way many people think about the role of human beings on, on planet Earth. We, we've come to see of ourselves as, as a scourge, as, as the opposite of the natural world, as the artificial species versus the natural world. And, and we're saying, hang on, we are of nature. We are, pos we are capable of integrating ourselves with nature. We are capable of farming in such ways that we can leave a landscape better off than it was when we harvest, than it was when we sowed, when we sowed the seeds. So th there's a whole lot of stuff that we've been through. And along, along the journey with us has been a software model that's gone through some seven iterations or seven major version changes uh, called CowHow. And CowHow has accumulated all of this thinking. And so in a way, it's, it's, um, this is the possibility here of thinking about farming differently through, through the software because it's enabled us to track all of these individual incremental thoughts that actually add up to a major perspective change. And that perspective change um, uh, manifests itself, for example, in our initial idea, or oh, we're going to have to have a thousand acres in order to make this work. And now we recognize with a further fine tuning that much of the magic in our thousand acre model was actually happening within 250 acres. But you have to spend time and go through the details and have people on the team. Like we've got um, uh, Dr. Annie Rayner and, um, uh, and, and Ali Murrell on our team now who um, have dug deep into that data and um, given me a very hard time at, um, in, and, and, and questioned many things and made it so that not, we didn't need a bigger model. We, we, we developed a model that was capable of showing we can do this on less land. That's, in a nutshell, um, some of the aspects that have come up for us as we dove deeper, if you want. It's been a journey of the soul. It's been a journey of the spreadsheet. And, and it's been a journey of um, uh, thinking through different ways of doing business and, and what disruption can mean. And so there, there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to bring it to, to <laughs> the now. And the, 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 the cow how, obviously, is a big piece of that. So what are you currently um, looking for proposing what what is the current form uh, that that new foundation farms wants to let's say we talk in a year from now the summer of, of 2024 and uh, what would you ideally um what would be to, what would we be talking about ideally at that time so 12 months from now we will have acquired a 250 acre farm we will have started our operations we will be uh, commencing the process of engaging with local people who will become customers not consumers we hate that word consumers i don't know about you but i'm a human being i'm not a unit in somebody else's marketing department i am a, a customer of companies or organizations and i and i um, am a citizen so um we will have a growing a uh, list of people excited about the prospect that there's food coming their way. Um, we will have employed a bunch of people on the first site, and we will all be ready be rolling up our sleeves in terms of phases two and three of this three-phase expansion of new foundation farms into operation. And just quickly to say what they are, because it's quite important in the understanding. You know, we've got a team of 10 people now. Why would you have a team of 10 people for, you know, in the, in the core to run a 250-acre farm? Well, you don't. You have that because we're building the capacity to create a complete transformation in the, in the farming, the processing, and the and the food delivery or retail systems. And so we need all of this capability. So first phase, 250 acres. Second phase is to expand that through leased land so that first hub becomes bigger and to develop partnerships with other farmers. And I would say that um, so second phase is, is grow that 250 to pick a number, a 1,000. Um, and as we grow, partner with other local farmers who then go on the journey with us. 
and we provide them with a guaranteed offtake route to market at a fair price. And because we're cutting out all the middlemen, um, there's nothing new about that. That's what Riverford do, for example, who have the vegetable box schemes here in the UK. Um, but deep long-term partnerships with other farmers willing to go on the journey. So we've expanded to a 1,000 acres, and as we do that, we go into the third phase. And the third phase is then where we go to much greater scale with, if you like, this visible proof that this is starting to happen on the ground in one hub. And the vision there is over the next 10 years, we go to six hubs, plus minus, It's the number's not important, but each of 10,000 acres of scale spread around the UK. And at that stage, we're starting to make a serious dent in people's understanding of what the food system can look like. And um, uh, in order to do that, we then have a series of different financial solutions for each of the three phases, which we can, I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it's a combination of operational planning and financial frameworks that will allow us to build an enterprise from 250 acres to 60,000 acres over 10 years in a, in in a three-step process. And, and just for, for the, the customers that, that join in that first, the, the first hub, what should they expect in terms of uh, food? Like you're, you're, we're mentioning the the stacking of different things. I'm mentioning it's it's more uh, larger uh, quantities of different things. Um, what what is the is it a full replacement of the supermarket or, or a majority one? What's the uh, the food that that these diverse farms can can deliver to my doorstep, or have, do I have to pick it up? I mean, that depends probably on what I want. Uh, but as a customer, what, what's my uh, what, what do I what do I look forward to uh, if I join, let's say, a year from now or, or slightly less? So the the, um, the there's a there's a whole range that uh, we'll be um, in, in engaging with uh, right at the beginning. So f first, the, the, let's let's start at the simple end. The the model is based on home delivery, and the home delivery will happen in uh, rechargeable electric vehicles. And there will be when uh, after, in the fourth year, we will have built up to 300 deliveries a day, and um, they'll be delivering the average shopping basket worth um, 55 pounds to approximately 2,000 homes um, uh, or 2,000 families. Um, so some of the calculations are, are based on the idea that there's an average of a four-person household buying what we uh, what we have to offer. And what we have to offer ranges from uh, grains, um, including oats, to um, various, uh, in fact, 42 um, lines of vegetables, uh, herbs, and soft fruit. There's honey, there's eggs, there's top fruit and nuts, um, there's milk, and then there's uh, meat in the form of beef, uh, uh, poultry, pork, and, and, and lamb. Or, or goat. And in fact, we've got a bit of a debate about the value of sheep in agriculture altogether, but that's for a separate uh, conversation. Um, now, there are obviously things that uh, you, you can't grow everything. Um, that, that's already quite a significant amount. Um, but um, there are things like cacao and coffee um, that you uh, can't uh, grow here, even if you tried. And we're not against trade. Um, we're against the faceless uh, trade in the form of commodities, just like Mark doesn't like the, the word consumer quite rightly. Um, I don't want to buy a commodity. I, I want to buy um, my, um, my things from uh, people or have an understanding that they actually come from people or, if you want, from another community. So we will be trading with other communities um, and encouraging regenerative approaches, whether it's in the uh, regional collaborations or whether it's in international collaborations. And we'll be very um, mindful of the footprint um, where we can deliver by cargo ship. Might maybe we, we will deliver by, by cargo ship. There are businesses that are now going that route rather than uh, fossil fuel um, for the delivery where that's possible. So we will be curating that kind of thing and delivering a very wide range of things um, that should, um, uh, uh, be beyond the immediate appeal of it being much healthier, um, uh, appeal also because of the variety of things that basically mean you can replace your weekly shop at a grocery store with the uh, weekly home delivery from uh, New Foundation Farms. And, and was the home delivery always part of the plan? I remember we talked a lot about the, the farm shop uh, years ago. Has that been a, a change um, deliberate or is there still both options? What, what, what has happened there or maybe nothing? I, I think we've um, 
what uh, th this is where if you like the iterative process has led to deeper insights and the deeper insight around food retail is is this idea that um it's a largely an undeveloped system since the 19 since it was founded in the 1930s 1920s different ideas but anyway between the first and second world wars and that um the the future as we see it is fundamentally about direct to home delivery of the bulk of nutrients that you need on an ongoing basis um, from local sources and then retail has a different purpose when we did the original designs we saw retail as replacing the supermarkets we now see uh, physical sites as much more about education and demonstration. Communication, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, the sort of, and the model is already there. Again, there's nothing that we need to invent in this principle because it's a principle that um, uh, a lot of um, a lot of brands have understood for some time, that the purpose of a store is not sales. That happens online. The purpose of a store is to excite people, to engage people, to allow people to experience and learn. And that's how we see it. So it's a shift in terms of the pipeline of how things ultimately end up in the home, but it's a blend of different solutions to enable people to, to learn, um, engage, and ultimately uh, make the decision to change the way that uh, food is uh, goes from the field to the fork. And I'm going to ask a question that might sound wrong, but... Is the countryside ready for that home delivery in a sense? You would imagine um, these kind of things to work really well in London, in Milan, in Amsterdam, in New York, where we're super used to, we, I'm saying the general we, to two clicks and stuff arrives on my doorstep and we're annoyed if that doesn't happen and blah, 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 blah. Um, you're going to be in the countryside, obviously, because you're going to buy a farm. Um, do you select as well, like good internet penetration or... Like, how, how do you select for that? Or has it shifted so much over the last years through COVID as well that we're, that e almost everywhere in the UK, people are, are ready to click that button uh, because it has to happen online and it has to get delivered to their place as the, the shop is not the main, uh, uh, the main interaction point or the main sales channel, at least. Well, un unlike other geographies, that, that one of the benefits of the UK is that it is a rather small island. And um, even when you're in the countryside, you're actually, yeah, apart from when it's really remote, not that far from um, um, significant conurbations. So um, clearly that is a um, part of our decision-making process for the, the ideal sites. There, there needs to be a um, uh, something that is say that the limitation is the reach of the electric vehicle um, um, and, and, and so, so that we can have a so reasonably responsible yeah. <laughs> the, the supply chain. But we, we are not holding ourselves to this idea that local means within 20 miles or 200 miles because that's actually, again, a matter of local context. What, what we mean first and foremost by local is that it's the opposite of the global supply chain. So it means it's connecting you with a region and an identity that comes from from the natural environment that you inhabit. Um, you know, Ethan Solovyev's idea of the life shed, that, that phrase, that, that the recognition that I am dependent and, and um, live in a reciprocal relationship with a piece of land and the water and, and the food, et cetera, that grows on that land is very much at the, at the heart of this. So that, that's the idea of local. Um, that's that that matters here, and in the UK, it's it's very much possible to identify uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of locations like that. So that that's one. The second thing is that there has actually been a, a silent um, or quiet uh, revolution in the UK in terms of. Uh, shopping or farm retail, it's it's um, that th there are uh, large numbers of of farm shops. So people are used and to, to to this way of shopping, and COVID shifted things in favour of that. Where you had global um, um, or supermarkets that were reliant on on global supplies, we we all realised that, um, that that you know how how uh, fragile they are, and and um, more local opportunities blossomed. And uh, the UK is well connected. Um, there, there isn't a significant um, uh, not spot um, environment. We're all uh, we're all uh, very connected, and we and our first uh, our first hub only requires two thousand households in the fourth year. So we're talking about 
fairly um, uh, moderate numbers. Um, uh, you know, that I've, as I used to work at, at Riverford, where, where we were dealing with hundreds of thousands of deliveries per week. And so you're raising now, what are you exactly raising for? Is it the simple, uh, uh, we, we need a quarter, so we need 5 million um, because we used to go, we used to try to raise for, for 1,000 and um, we're targeting 20 million. What, what has, has anything shifted there? It's 5 million. Does it feel um, more uh, reachable? Because sometimes it's actually easier to raise a lot more than it is to raise less. That's an interesting piece. I mean, you've have probably talked to any investor interested in agriculture and food over the last years. So how does it feel to go to market now with, um, with, this, uh, with this raise? It feels um, like to, it feels like the right thing to do um, because we know that this um, uh, is is the way it can go. It's um, uh, and and so the, the number also comes about in part because of the if you want the alchemy of our journey in that that was um, we, it, just above that number is what we soft circled in our first um, attempt. It wasn't enough to get us over the minimum threshold to buy a thousand acres. But it, um, if, if you um, turn back the clock and um, we, we were only raising 5 million, you could go through the mind game of saying, oh, yeah, we achieved that then. So there's the, there's the connection. The two are connected in that we, we did actually um, get to that number um, th theoretically in, in, in the first And now approach. we'll see if that soft circle, what, how soft the soft circle was and, and uh, yeah. what has happened, of course, over the years. But it, it's a good sign, at least. Like it's, it seems feasible, although the world has changed significantly. Well, it's interesting because when we, you know, the, um, you know, part of your question was, is 250 acres, you know, divide by four and divide the amount by four? Um, fascinatingly, no, the answer is it's, um, the, the process was bottom up. So having gone on this journey and, and concluded that we could do this on a much smaller acreage, um, we, uh, we then said, okay, well, based on that smaller acreage, what is the capital requirement? Because a lot of other things had changed as well. It was, um, you know, the level of detail in our analysis and, and, and business design was another quantum beyond where we had been previously. And, and therefore, if you were to dig into the cow how model, what you'll see is a much more sophisticated understanding of the value chain between the field and the fork than perhaps we had at the beginning, which in turn allows us to um, sort of be much more precise about the quantums of capital we require. We should also say that the actual total capital requirement is 7.5 million over, um, over four years. Um, and the uh, so 5 million is the equity side. And over time, we see the balance of the funding coming from um, essentially, we've modeled it as debt finance and explored the modeling that we've done and said, if we were to come to market with a you know, million pound debt instrument raised in two years time, we won't need it in the first year. Um, how does that look? And received a very warm and positive response. So um, there's a lot under the numbers that are a lot more than simply, oh, it's just the original number divided by four. It's actually bottom up and very detailed in its planning. The other thing that's changed is um, that we are, well, two other things have changed. Uh, first thing is we're a much bigger team. We touched on that a little bit earlier, but, you know, there's 10 of us now. And, um, w you know, with the funding, it would have been, you know, we could be, uh, the, let's put it, no, let me say that again. Um, so two, uh, two other, two things have changed, um, if you like, within our own landscape, in addition to the refinement and the modeling and the direction of travel. The one is that the team is, a whole lot bigger and stronger. And we've found ourselves being able to attract really talented people um, across the spectrum of the expertise that we need to execute this field to fork approach. Um, and secondly, we have now been through an external funding round. And, uh, you know, that, that process of um, going to market, which we did last last September, October, for a uh, an, for a convertible loan, a uh, convertible loan note, um, uh, was for us a wonderful expression of confidence um, and 
that, uh, as you know, of course, in 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 um, in any new enterprise, there's a quantum leap in the, the journey between being a bunch of people with a nice idea and a bunch of people with a nice idea that has now received funding and the money in the bank. Yeah, which we were yes. very lucky and, and happy. To, to participate in personally uh, with, with a few thousand and through a small syndicate we have been running. So we're a part of this journey and definitely biased uh, in this case. And um, so that, that that shift, the fact that you've raised some money uh, oversubscribed, I think, uh, I mean, leave it up to you to release how much, um, the, the conversation with other investors, the fact that you have raised some real cash in the bank and, and not like you said, uh, some some people with a nice a nice set of spreadsheets uh, there's no question it, it changes the quality of the conversations um especially when and people can look at our website we've asked um a, a number of the of the funders to um if they'll be willing to become visible and it's a from our point of view a very impressive list of people who are at the forefront of building this new regenerative food system um and uh uh, so, yes, it absolutely does change things because we're essentially saying we're in now at the stage where we're saying we're inviting more people to come on this journey with us. And for us, we see this isn't just about you know putting some money to work. It's an invitation to co-steward with us the future of, the, of a new food system. It's, it's much more profound for us. We've dedicated our lives to this, um, and a growing number of people are doing it. And it is, um, it is a passion that we also look for in the people that we um, are pleased to see come to the table to fund us as well. Because it's this is a journey of, um, in a sense, a journey of belief about something that's possible that could be completely different from the world we live in today. And that's really uh, exciting to be part of. Yeah, and my, my reasoning to to invest is as well, like we cannot afford, no, we cannot afford not to try. Um, am I convinced it's going to work? I don't know. Um, but do I want to see this happen? And I'm sure there are quite a few people actually want to see you fail. Um, but I definitely want to see you succeed. And I want to see if this is possible, the, the stacking, all the pieces, and um, that requires some money and that requires skin in the game. So that's, uh, that's the reasoning behind that. And I want to double click a bit on the journey piece as well um, with you, Mark, as we talked a lot about in the first interview, uh, the regenerative business piece has that thinking, understanding um, changed as well over the last years? And and if so, how? Has it been deepening on, on the deeper generation piece? We can definitely click on that as well. But also this role of the enterprise, the role of, um, you already mentioned the role of human beings in um, as a keystone species and a potential um, positive impact or, or net positive. Um, has your your thoughts and your understanding of the potential net positive role of, of enterprises and companies also changed? Um, it's gained in depth and detail a, a huge amount. Um, just on, on the, if you want the, a, a really practical and it almost feels a bit superficial, but if we go back to the, the model, cow how Marx just referred to it, there was a, a de- um, We've, we've had these seven versions that I've referred to, and it's it's now got what Mark referred to as a bottom-up approach. What that means is that we can actually say, um, based on reliable farm data and assuming uh, a worst or normal case development, we can tell you how much will grow on that site. And um, we, we, for each individual thing, so in, in our first fundraise, one of the questions was, well, how many pork chops are you going to um, sell? Um, and, and we weren't able to answer it at that time because the approach um, worked on budgets rather than on the, the bottom-up detail. So um, that, that level of clarity and fine-tuning, honing in onto that um, is very inspiring because it, um, it connects with other things I've done in the past where I've often been confronted in my career with people who wanted to see things fail or who only supported it because they, they somehow had a, 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 a pre-Schadenfreude that they wanted, this isn't possible. And, and it's, it is possible. And one of the things, this is, so this is where technology um, can be really helpful 
helpful in uh, computers can help us process in a way we can't think in the detail, but we can think in terms of the vision. And and so the, 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 the that's making me really hopeful. So where, where I think I, I talked a lot about ESG and the cynicism behind ESG in my in my in my previous interview, I, I think this idea of basing an economy not just within the um, planetary boundaries, but actually building so so that's still old world thinking. Um, trying to be within the planetary boundaries. That's polluting less or polluting. Uh, you know, we, we don't zero. actually have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 that that's that's sort of trying to have it both ways, and then you have it neither way. It's possible. Um, in time, I'm absolutely confident. It's, uh, and in fact, th- there is a large organization in Brazil that farms 60,000 hectares and uh, is known to the outside world as a sugar ma- manufacturer, but inside has a biodiversity that um, is more than 50% of the nearby Sao Paulo National Park. This is the Balbo Group. Um, they, they, the channel, yeah. Organization. Yeah organizations like that demonstrate that you can do this at scale and they demonstrate something else too. They demonstrate this idea that we are in a competitive world and that evolution is driven by competition. It's total bogus. If um, the, the, It's driven by collaboration. Um, if you if it's based on comp- competition, you you compete yourself out of the planet, which is what we've just done. It's the collaboration piece that really makes a difference. Does competition happen within the collaboration? Totally. Is competition for the best ideas important? Absolutely. But the ultimate piece is a collaborative piece, and that's where also joy is at home. Um, I've worked for so many people who um, who are just bitter because their whole worldview is somehow based on um, uh, a and, positive and Mark mentality. is one of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, Mark, yeah, yeah. I mean, no. Oh, he's still contrary, on the call here. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, so no, the fun and joy piece. I'm, I'm making a joke here, but the fun and joy piece is is fundamental. Like, it's like how how is this going to be a marathon if, if the the first meters are already horrible? It, it's uh, one uh, of the amazing things, actually, about our journey is that um, you know people would say three years in three and a half four years into building new foundation farms. And you're, you bitter? Going, yeah. you're only going mm-hmm. operational now, you know, kind of, go, uh, you must be exhausted. And actually, we're not, we're more excited. Because you haven't been about, farming, would, would be an answer well, as well. <laughs> there, yeah. Well, no, don't forget that in the team, we've all done lots of farming. So it's not that, yeah, no, no, it's not that we're um, uh, unaware of the challenges. <laughs> that, that, Sorry, that's Marcus, that's, that's back to that's, you. That old hat, you know, when when people used to say, I mean, we're so glad that Claire Hill has joined us as director of farming operations. I mean, she's such a such a gem. But you see, the 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 above the knowledge, the deep understanding of farming and especially regenerative farming, Claire is also um, one of those beautiful people who's capable of connecting to people and motivating people and recognizing the talent and skill that they bring along as opposed to expecting a job sheet um, uh, to be ticked off by the end of the day. Um, Another example of how regeneration is first and foremost about collaboration. The mindset shift is about recognizing the collaborative opportunities and how in a way what we, we, we have to go through that process of unknowing the control and recognizing the collaborative opportunity and so th- th- these are all things but it what, it what it amounts to is abundance at, on all layers it's it's the abundance below the soil it's the abundance in in my my soul the soul the joy of of recognizing how um, we can collaborate with each other and other humans but also step back and have a little humility and see that we can collaborate with uh, water cycles and um, bees and that we don't have to use invasive foreign bees but we can work with our local bees that live in our woodlands and we can bring them onto our farms and that a farm becomes you know a wellspring of life rather than um essentially a death sentence for the natural world 
So I'm very, very positive that business is a is a suitable um, organizational structure um, that can bring um, together capital, organizational capacity, um, uh, technology, um, equipment, and land in order to um, uh, bring about the much needed rural regeneration that we've all been waiting for. So it's safe to say we we are in in an iPhone moment. That is, yeah, the, the, the new foundation farms is simply about just uh, taking um, bits and pieces that have been proven all around the world. Nothing in what we do is um, fundamentally new. It's the way we've put it together into a very sound business plan with a very competent team. And, and we're going to execute that. So, and then, and then as in for us, the, the iPhone moment is, is already happened because we know it and, and we're just going to demonstrate. And people have now. shown things, yeah. Go, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, you know, as I was listening to this part of our conversation, I was picking up on on something that uh, sits very profoundly in in uh, a lot of our really good conversations with funders, which is not you know, could this work? Does it work? Uh, you know, show me the detail because I mean, anybody who looks at the th- you know the detail and looks at the quality of the team, it's hard not to reach the conclusion we've got the expertise to do this. It's it's a different thing. It's what if we're right? What if we are right? Because if we are right, then we are talking about a future food system that is so much better than the one we've got. And you know, we can have rewilding and regeneration uh, because we'll need a fraction of the lands for for food that we currently currently use we can have local food we can have resilience there's so much we can have that um uh, that that comes with this iphone moment and 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 so for me- many of the people who uh, we talk to who are excited about this it's that thought it's w- what if we're right what if we are right uh, because if we are we, we're all on a different journey to the one we've been on for the last possibly nine thousand years I mean, it depends how far back you want to go since the day we first put a plow into the ground and started buggering up the ecology and creating deserts. You know, we're at the moment of change. It's such a profound ending, but I wanted to ask a question about accessibility and prices, but it just doesn't feel really the, the right um, bridge, let's say. But I'm going to do it anyway. For those 2,000 people, like just what if you're right? What does it mean? We talked about what they would get, apart from the fact that we get a neighbor nearby uh, that is farming profoundly different than anything else probably uh, in in their uh, vicinity but also is this um is this accessible like what have you modeled you've gone deep into the yeah. cost structures you've gone deep into what is needed to keep this company alive to keep it profitable of course with the investors etc cetera, etc cetera. but also what does it mean um for uh, p- apart from the quality, which is probably a way different than what you can actually get now in the supermarket, but let's let's leave that at that. Nutrient density research will come, is coming, um, and and all that. But if we just look at tomato, tomato, apple, apple, piece of beef, etc., um, how do you make sure this is accessible? Or is it because you're cutting out everything? By definition, we're actually uh, in in a in a position that it is accessible for almost everyone. What, what is the accessibility piece? I'm just asking the the devil's advocate question that some funders might ask. There are so many layers to to answer that question about accessibility, but let's deal with the big picture first. I was asked this by a bunch of people from Nestle and Unilever, and um, and they were saying, yeah, but isn't the farming going to be more expensive? And I said, well, actually, in our view, the total delivered cost of food doesn't need to be more expensive. If any, we think it will probably go down, the total cost of delivered food. And the total cost of delivered food represents a highly profitable supply chain, just not currently for the people who produce it, but very profitable if you're a big supermarket or a big wholesaler or a supplier of industrial chemicals. It's great, lovely business. So, um, and guess who's telling us that um, these other systems are not going to work. It's the same story as we get in in the energy system, where you get engineers who spend their lives with big power stations telling us, oh, we can't have uh, an energy system unless we have big baseload power stations. Yes, we can. We can have a distributed system. And every house can be energy efficient. We just have chosen not to do it yet, partly because of the fog created by those who have a vested interest in the current 
way the system works and not with bad will just because you know when all you've got is a hammer everything looks like a nail and uh, that's the same in the food system our view is in the long run there is nothing in this approach that suggests that food needs to be more expensive and therefore if it doesn't need to be more expensive accessibility is not a not a problem accessibility is not a problem and it is a combination of many things that makes that a statement true in terms of relative costs. Um, uh, yes, the the benefit of the whole value chain, um, but also loss of loss of inefficiency. For example, you know we know that forty percent of the food that's grown is wasted in the supply chain. I mean, just reduce that by you know, by half, and you've got a completely different set of numbers in the delivered cost of food. Yeah. So there's so much in this that. But the thing to stick in the head is that fundamentally. We don't need some super premium uh, at the point where we, the citizens, buy the food in order to make this kind of alternative food system work. Marcus, you had something I, to add. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's definitely one of those multidimensional um, questions. And there's lots of accessibility. There's accessibility to land, for example. There's accessible, access to health. Um, access to health through food is something that our current healthcare system is not particularly good at. Um, we spend um, uh, millions on fertilizer and then uh, and, and farming subsidies, and then we spend millions on um, obesity, and um, the the two can be married up. Um, we we are essentially all eating nutrient poor diets. We, we focus on the calorie and then at the expense of the nutrient and so forth. But I think the question you're asking ultimately is of the, the social nature. Is this food more expensive? Is it, is it like, um, like organic more expensive? Um, and, and I would say at this point in time, it's sort of a little bit difficult to, to see what's, um, what's ahead because new opportunities like the software on your mobile phone open a whole new possibility for conversation. But the, I think I'm, I'm going to ha uh, hazard a, a macroeconomic guess, which is that food can, on average, be um, produced in these ways for the same or less, um, or sold for the same or less, while at the same time removing vast externalities um, we, we talk about cheap food, um, but that's obviously not a truth. Um, it's cheap at the point of sale and very costly in terms of the environmental impact. So I see a world um, in a few years' time when um, you know, the immediate pressure um, to demonstrate a profitable business to the, fir the, first, the current and future funders um, uh, recedes a little where we can talk about other social models of pricing where maybe uh, people in the immediate vicinity um, uh, pay different amounts for their food according to what they think it's worth and according to what they can afford. But that we have to develop the systems, we have to engage in that kind of conversation. But I think people, yeah, it, it, take it back to something Mark said earlier, uh, supermarkets only came about in, um, in the way they are today between the two world wars. And they were based on the commodification and the emergence of brands. And um, until the 1920s, you didn't pay a uniform price. In a supermarket, even when there even when there was a grocer, you would pay based on a negotiation on price. Before a grocer became a store, in the sen in the se in the sense that you would go there, food was home delivered. In a certain way, we are talking about um, you know things that have uh, we, we've had a brief blip where food was concentrated to the benefit of brands and um, the logistics provided by supermarkets, and by taking that um, out of it, food becomes more affordable for more people. It's fascinating the the price piece, the delivery piece, and and we. We see it in many cases, of course, we we're used, so used to, to the supermarkets that we sort of take it for granted. They've always been there since the invention of the plow. And, and of course, that's not the case. And, uh, but it holds any innovation. We've so been used to landlines. We've been used to centralized power. We've been used to uh, the great landscapes. And, and we sort of cannot imagine in many cases what, what it looks, what it could look like. Um, which I think is a good 
way to to bring this conversation to uh, to a hold or a temporary one because for sure you'll be back and we'll be following this uh, this journey as it unfolds further i wish you all the best with the fundraise um, and hopefully we'll we'll be following the the farming piece and um, you'll be in the market soon for uh, for a farm which means um, this spreadsheet is going to land somewhere uh, with roots somewhere with deep roots and uh, and probably not with a plow passing by every now and then so i'm, I'm looking forward to that moment and, and let's see if the naysayers are are wrong and uh, we'll we'll see how how abundant these systems can be thank you Kuhn. thank you Kuhn. thank you for being part of uh, a subspecies of humankind a beneficial keystone species in the making <laughs> thank you so much Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.